Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on my behalf. I was asked to um, share some ideas with you, and it, it's really just that, about a concept that uh, Zucat has been grappled with for the last couple of years especially, which is the concept of organizational excellence. Right, so I'll throw some ideas out. Part of it is slightly opinionated, as you will notice. Part of it is research-based. Part of it is actually borrowed from uh, well-known names, as you will soon see. Right. It's always nice to catch up and read up with uh, what people have been studying in the past, what people have researched in the past. And, of course, one comes across uh, some great names. One of them, in my opinion, is Charles Darwin, the father of the evolution theory. Now, you may immediately wonder what that has to do with today's organizations, today's companies, and organizational excellence. But Charles Darwin made an interesting observation. When it comes to survival in the world, and he was, of course, talking about biological survival, he came to the conclusion that it's not always the strongest that survive, and he says, neither do the most intelligent. It is the species that is most adaptable to change. Now, immediately, this was written well over 150 years ago. Immediately, that conjures up images of the jungle of today's corporate world. Now, how do we survive in the corporate world? We've heard of many uh, large and seemingly or seemingly indestructible companies going down overnight. Uh, some well-published, well-publicized uh, financial disasters and scandals in the early 2000s, uh, Enron being the most notable one, taking Anderson Consulting with them uh, to a large extent, and so on and so on. So why do these things happen? For different reasons, but in general, it turns out that if one looks at the history of organizations, and organizations, large organizations, as we'll see in a minute, are actually a product of the 20th century. We'll notice that organizations <coughs> who do adapt to change very well are the ones that survive. Now, immediately, I would like to uh, use another example. You all know Nokia, right, the mobile phone company. Now, currently, they're, they're honestly not doing too well. They are, the last two, three years, they've been really surprised by... Um, smartphone technology, Apple, uh, Blackberry, and so on. Now, but nonetheless, they're a company that have survived the highs and the lows of business for how many years, do you think? How old do you think is the company in Nokia? Pardon, come here. 1960 or 60 years old? Uh, that's not a bad guess. Um, anybody else wants to take a guess? I think Nokia was founded in 1859, if, uh, if I remember, somewhere around there, I may be off by a year or two. It started off initially under a different name, but after a few years, they moved to uh, close to a town called Nokia in Finland by the river, the Nokia something, right, in Finnish. And uh, that's when they adopted the name of Nokia. Now, in 1859, there was no mobile communication technology, so what were they doing? They started off as a paper and pulp industry. They have shown great um, tendency towards innovation from the start because I believe they came up with a certain invention of paper, a special type of paper, which nobody else at the time uh, actually had come up with. So innovation has always been at the forefront of their development and perhaps that is why they still are with us today in the form of mobile communication technology uh, manufacturers and providers. They've been through a phase where they were manufacturing copper cabling uh, and so on and so on. How does that happen? Right? Probably, uh, as we'll see, by, by leadership, by inspiration, and by understanding very well the market conditions of today and having perhaps a fairly good idea of what the market will do tomorrow. Now, if I were to ask you today, uh, what do you think our economy, our market will look like in five years from now? Personally, I don't quite know. Everybody's expecting big changes, right? I was in South Africa two weeks ago, and I was talking to my uh, financial advisor, if I can call him that, uh, about the market. And he says, everybody's expecting a 30 to 40% correction, 
right? The Johannesburg market has been doing extremely well in the past two, three years. Uh, everybody's expecting a correction, but the big question is when. When will it tumble? I mean, 30, 40% correction is actually not a correction. That's almost a, it's almost a crash. Everybody knows it's coming. It's overvalued. Yeah. How, you know, this is truth or day, you know, how long do you dare to keep your investments uh, before, before they come tumbling down? Anyway, so adapting to change is something that in organizations, especially the leadership, needs to really put in the forefront of their, of their mind as one of the top priorities. What is the economy going to do? Right. Not just the economy, what is society going to do perhaps? Another great thinker that uh, I discovered these people fairly late, fairly late in my life and fairly late in their life, which uh, apparently, uh, obviously, uh, Drucker has, has uh, passed away in the early uh, 21st century. But uh, a, great, a great philosopher, a great thinker about management, about organizational theories. And I've just highlighted two of his, uh, his observations is that the birth of the large organization is a 20th century phenomenon. Apparently, um, you may remember the antitrust lawsuit that the American government tried to, uh, tried to pin on Microsoft, and they tried to break it down because Microsoft was at one stage perceived to have monopoly over certain products. That antitrust law existed in the early 20th century, and in 1912, apparently, there was an antitrust lawsuit against the company, I forget the name, because they were employing almost 400 people. And the American government said this was, this was too dangerous, this is too big, 400 employees. So that, that, was, that was gigantic in those days. So we didn't have, before 20th century, actually you know, since 1920s and so on, 1930s perhaps, we didn't have large organizations. Today, organizations with 10,000 employees are not really exceptional anymore. All right, so how do we manage those? And another observation that uh, Drucker came out with, and this is a term that he actually coined, is that a lot of our people are involved in what he calls knowledge work, service industry. We, we don't work physically. We don't lift things and move things. We don't create things. We don't, we don't grow crops physically ourselves, most of us don't, we have a computer. Deming already did, uh, so Edwards Deming, he uh, already wrote in 1982 that in the US, 86% of people were employed in the service sector, including service to manufacturing and so on. But actually, only 14% were physically involved in manufacturing uh, and growing crops and so on and so on. So primary sector, secondary sector, 14%, tertiary sector, 86%. Drucker coined the term knowledge work. And now managing a manufacturing uh, plant or a company has its, of course, has its challenges, but it's fairly straightforward compared to, Drucker says, compared to managing knowledge workers. Knowledge workers are educated, knowledge workers' job descriptions are perhaps not as clear as they are in somebody who is in a manufacturing plant and he needs to tighten bolts or he needs to put a piece into a car and it, as it passes on the production line. All right, so those, those are two interesting things. So we're sitting with this, this concept of change and today we feel this more and more uh, prominently. We're also sitting with the difficulty of managing knowledge workers right, in large organizations. And the last uh, thought I want to use as an introduction is uh, the great man himself, in my opinion, Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Has anybody heard of Dr. Deming? He's American, but after the Second World War, he migrated to Japan. Could have been late 40s, early 50s. Um, somebody said, and I think so, I got, maybe it was you, that MacArthur actually asked him to go there to go and help uh, uh, Japan rebuild the economy. And he did such an excellent job that he was awarded uh, the highest order of merit by the emperor of Japan that had never, ever been bestowed on a foreigner before. That is how much the Japanese appreciated his efforts. He spent the best part of 20 years in Japan helping companies uh, aim for, he started off as a quality guru, but he turned out to be much more than that. He turned out to be very good at understanding the psychology of organizations, the psychology of management, and so on. So, 
if, if you have nothing to read on the holidays, I could recommend any of those names. He said that advances in competitive position, this is in his book Out of the Crisis, which was first published in 1982. Advances in competitive position will have their roots in knowledge. The book was called Out of the Crisis, and it was about America. And the Americans said, Deming, what are you on about? Crisis? We don't have a crisis. He already saw it coming because he knew down to the bone how Japanese were working. He understood the cultural differences. And he knew that Japan for the next 20 years was going to flood, take over the global market. Uh, and America and Europe alike had great problems trying to keep stride with those. In a, different, in a different context, but the two are very related, as you can see, he then also made a comment that the essence of management is to make that knowledge right, productive. Uh, knowledge management is, uh, is a trendy term these days. We, we do knowledge management, we have a database. Right. I don't think any company has no database. It, it matters what you do with it. Right. Um, why do we need databases? Why do we need history of what we've done in the past is so we can learn from it. All right. Many companies that are in some form of trouble, they try and solve the trouble by hiring a big name CEO from outside. That CEO may have very little knowledge of your business and may have zero knowledge of your specific history in the business. All right. So how is that going to, how is that going to bring you good solutions. Right? Sometimes it does work, sometimes it doesn't work. Mostly those people come in and apply draconian measures to the organization to try and turn around the balance sheet, but in the meantime, uh, the staff turnover triples or whatever, people have enough, they don't want to live under those conditions and so on.